Welcome to Lecture Night at the David Dunlap Observatory with the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, Toronto Centre. My name is Denise Chilton and I am the RASC Toronto Centre DDO Committee Chair. I'm happy to be your host for tonight's lecture. The Royal Astronomical Society of Canada's mission is to enhance understanding of and inspire curiosity about the universe through public outreach, education and support for astronomical research. In partnership with the City of Richmond Hill, RASC hosts outreach activities at the David Dunlap Observatory, or DDO. The observatory is home to Canada's largest optical telescope, and our regular programming there includes tours of the facility, observing, and astronomy-themed lecture nights, among other activities. While our activities at the DDO are currently on pause due to coronavirus closures, we are delighted to be able to bring you some of the lecture nights we had planned for this summer through this webcast instead. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight's letter, lecture. Astrophysicist, science communicator, educator and researcher, Dr. Parshadi Patel. Dr. Patel is an adjunct research professor in the Faculty of Education at Western University. Her research focuses on understanding people's perspectives on and engagement with science, technology, engineering, and mathematics careers. Dr. Patel is also the Educational Outreach and Communication Specialist at the Institute for Earth and Space Exploration at Western. She holds a PhD in Astronomy and Planetary Science and Exploration from Western University. She develops and leads classroom workshops and camps, produces podcasts, organizes public events, trains educators, and acts as a science consultant for children's books. She is the co-founder of Women of Color in STEAM Canada. That's science, technology, engineering, arts, mathematics, and medicine. Dr. Patel is also an avid photographer. If we are lucky, we may even see some of her own night sky photos in her lecture tonight. Dr. Patel's lecture is titled, We Are All Made of Stardust, and she will be talking about the elements that compose our universe and us. If you, our viewers, have questions for Dr. Patel, please ask them in the YouTube chat. Dr. Patel will have some time to answer questions at the end of her talk. Without further ado, welcome Dr. Parshadi Patel. Everyone, I'm really excited to be here today. Uh, I'm obviously going to be talking about one of the uh, most um, intriguing topics uh, that, you know, when I talk to people, they have told me that, you know, they did not know they were made of stardust. So today we're going to kind of dive into understanding where all of these elements come from, which are present in our body, and, you know, how they have all survived all this 13.7 billion years. Um, I did want to start off with, you know, kind of a picture of me with DDO because I do miss being there. Um, I had, you know, I was lucky enough to be uh, to be at DDO uh, for last two years when we were doing summer camps there, and also partnering with the RASC uh, DDO team while we were there. Um, so while you know we cannot be there in person, I'm hoping that we'll stake you, we'll stick, uh, take you to through, through the journey of um, of the universe in in an online format. So let's get started. Um, you know, one of the most important things when we talk about um, the stardust or just life in general is kind of looking back at Earth. Uh, here is uh, one of the famous images uh, of, you know, Earth from the moon. And I absolutely love this image just because it shows us how small yet big, uh, you know, life is uh, because we are in such a small planet yet uh, for humans and for whatever life we have here on Earth, it's a big place. Um, however, if you look in um, throughout our solar system and or throughout the universe, we have always wondered whether there is life. So, you know, when we talk about life, the only option or like the only uh, example we have is what we see here on Earth. Now, what I would call as a life starter kit is taking the one and only example we have right now that is our own Earth. And we know, um, having explored Earth for so many years and decades and centuries, uh, we know that water is one of the things that is absolutely required for life to be here on Earth. Not all life requires water per se. Uh, 
it's it's required, however, for their production. And in many ways, uh, if you look at it in a form that they require either to reproduce or to uh, to just you know flourish in the environment that they are in, we also know that our life ourself is a carbon based life. Now, why carbon? I mean, we have wondered that. Carbon is known to be a strong uh, element that bonds very strongly with a lot of uh, you know, other elements uh, in the periodic table. Uh, but also at the same time, we know that it has a very high boiling point. We also know it comes in very many different formats. Most of you obviously know it as you know, diamond. We all love to look at the diamond. However, you know, could there be possibility of life in a universe that is not carbon? I mean, we can always imagine here on Earth, we know it's carbon based. Uh, another thing that we do know that we require for life as kind of a starter kit is, is some form of heat, whether it's heat underneath the surface of, you know, the oceans, that's the heat vents we have, or on the surface, uh, heat from our sun. So heat water, carbon, or some kind of elements, or organic material, is some of the starter things that you require for life. Now, if you look at human body itself, because, you know, I said we are all made of stardust, so we, as humans, are talking about ourselves. And so if we talk about that, you know, we're made of water, we're made of protein, we're made of minerals, carbohydrates, and fats. Now, if you break them down in the elements, we know water is H2O, hydrogen and oxygen. So obviously we have oxygen in our body. We have tons of oxygen, actually 65% of it. A lot of carbon, 18%. And if you go down the list, we have hydrogen, nitrogen, calcium, phosphorus, and a lot of other um, you know, elements in our body. Some of the things that I really like to concentrate are, are simple things that is easy to you know, kind of think of. For example, iron in my blood or calcium in my bones um, or in my teeth. Um, you know, things like that, oxygen in my, uh, in my uh, lungs. Uh, all of those are kind of these different elements that we find in our own body. But one of the things that we want to know, they're all made of stardust, or are they really? Uh, because if you would have asked me 10, 20, 30 years ago, uh, you know, we may not know, because this is actually one of the most active fields of research, um, astrochemistry, as we like to call it. And we try and learn as much as we can with the new kind of, uh, you know, telescopes and new kind of technologies that are available. Now, imagine if I was a chemist. This is what the periodic table looks like. These are all the elements that are either man-made or natural occurring that we know of. So as you see up here on the top, we have hydrogen, that is number one, okay? All those numbers that you're seeing are basically the number of protons. And we don't really need to go into a lot of details of that, but that just means, you know, all these numbers, hydrogen has one proton, helium has two, you know, you keep going and going. As a chemist, this looks like a great table. As an astronomer, just because of the way universe is made, we would call this more of an astronomer periodic table. So this is what I would say, you know, as an astronomer, I would use, well, 10 years ago, and I'll tell you why. That's because hydrogen, the most abundant element in the universe, around 75% of it, uh, of the universe uh, is, is hydrogen. The 23 to 24% is helium, which is right here. And that's why it says nearly everything in the universe and everything else. And then everything else you saw on that periodic table, other than the man-made, are trace elements. So whether they're metals, okay? Iron is known in a star killer. We'll tell you why in a bit. And then there's supernova poop. <laughs> um, so all of these things, other than hydrogen and helium, are only available in very trace amounts. Metals are formed in stars. And then supernova poop is obviously all the material that's formed in the supernova. Now, 10 years ago, this is what would have been kind of the ideal, uh, you know, periodic table to show for astronomers. However, as I said, this is an evolving research field. And so what we have learned in the last few years is that this is more or less actually like what an astronomer's periodic table should look like. So we have the hydrogen up here again, 75%. Close to 25%, we have helium, and you can see like that's 100%. Well, like very, very, very few, uh, few micro, 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 um, you know, I guess percentage if you want to count it, very, very small amount, or fractions are basically metals. And we astronomers like to call everything other than hydrogen and helium 
metals. <laughs> so anything that's on the periodic table is metals unless you're talking about hydrogen and helium. So if we look at this one, this looks a little bit different than the last picture that I was showing you. And that's because we do know now more about where these metals come from that we talk about. They have their different phenomena that actually create these metals. And so we're going to talk about all of these. So let's start with these ones up top here. CNO, it's carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. So we know now that carbon and nitrogen, we'll go into a little bit more detail how that happens, are formed in low mass stars when they die. We have oxygen and all the other elements until iron actually form in the supernova. And then surprising enough, in the amazing research that has been last, done in last few years, we have found that the neutron stars, when they actually merge, and this you might would have heard from LIGO, um, and you know, that kind of research is actually now giving us more insight in the fact that the more shiny things that we like to wear, for example, gold, silver, um, things like that are actually produced when uh, uh, neutron stars merge. And, and it's very interesting that within last few years, we have been able to figure this out with the new technologies that have been available. And now we can say that we know that there are so many elements that actually form in these star mergers, in, in the collapse of you know, massive stars when they die, as well as when uh, low mass stars die as well. So we're going to look at all of these and how they actually all of them form. So let's start at the beginning. Um, Big Bang, 13.7 million uh, billion years ago, not million, a <laughs> billion years ago, um, universe, you know, came into being. It was very, very hot. Uh, what it did happen because of the heat started to inflate. Okay. And as it started to expand, it had a soup of fundamental particles. So imagine yourself having a soup and all the things that you're seeing in your soup are basically these very, very, very fundamental particles, which end up then making all of these elements that we are now seeing today. And as the universe is expanding, it's obviously cooling down. So if you have a hot, uh, you know, if you have a, a round blob of hot air, you expand it, it starts to cool down. And as it cooled over time, it was able to make the most first basic elements that we now see. Um, and so within first three minutes, it was able to form hydrogen and helium, okay? Some of the stuff that we obviously know forms most of the universe. And then a very, very fraction amount of lithium and beryllium as well, which, are com which comes next on the periodic table. So you can see that over time, if we start from this map right here with the Big Bang and we had the inflation, we had the soup of these basic, basic material. You're getting to a point within the first three minutes when you're starting to form the elements that are still in the most abundant um, when you count you know, the amount of elements that are available and further actually go into you know, the current universe where we, we still see them. We see the relic of this particular Big Bang. And um, we see what happened during that time. One of the most interesting things to now get, you know, now try to understand is that if these elements actually form in the first three minutes, you can imagine the first set of stars would not have had any elements like metals. So it would have just been hydrogen, helium, and then all these elements that are part of, you know, our solar system, our sun, all of these trace metals that we talk, like to talk about they were all actually formed in the stars later. So the first set of stars would not have had any kinds of metals in them. So that's super interesting. So, you know, we understood now that we had, you know, hydrogen and helium falling, uh, uh, forming in those first few minutes. At least the starter, it, it started off in the first three minutes and then gone from there. But what about the rest of them? I mean, I, I quickly gave you guys a glimpse of where we're going to go with this. And that's actually the amazing star forming regions. So this is, you know, my research area. I absolutely love looking at star forming regions. Here's Lagoon Nebula. You can see it's amazingly beautiful. You can imagine that the first set of stars did not have, the, when they formed, they didn't have any metals in them. And, and, you know, for the rest of the talk, when I talk about metals, it's everything else other than hydrogen and helium. So they didn't have any metals in them. However, when they died, they basically shed out all this material 
into these regions where the next set of stars are going to form. And that's where you have all these material or all these metals now becoming part of these star forming regions where the new stars are going to form. So, you know, let's look at how these stars actually form. You have this giant cloud of gas and dust. And thanks to gravity and some small clumps that start to form, basically you have all this material that try and go towards the center of this clump. Okay, you're dr drawing all these gas inward. And, you know, you start to form like a flat disk around this uh, particular protostar, as we like to call it. And over time, you have a lot of material that's accreting on it, and it gets to a point where it becomes massive enough that the internal temperature is good enough for hydrogen to start um, to start igniting, basically. You have, you know, hydrogen fusion that starts, and at the same time, you have material around in the disk that is, you know, starting to form dust and starting to you know, basically stick to each other, forming small boulders and over time planets or planetesimals. And then, you know, based on the time, you could have all these gas that basically dissipates, you're left with a lovely dusty region around the star, which, you know, eventually becomes into a, a planetary system. So you can imagine if this, the first set of stars basically populated their near surroundings with all these metals, the next generation of stars and planets and these planetesimals that are forming around these newly formed stars will have all those metals inherited in them. And so that's one of the key things is to remember that, you know, all the material here on Earth that we're seeing and in our solar system is basically inherited from the dead stars before us. And so let's talk about stars. Now, stars come in very many different flavors. And the, by flavors, we mean, you know, by size and, 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 uh, and, and by temperature. So if you look at uh, the different kinds of stars, we have, you know, M, K, G, F, A, B, O. Um, and G is the sun, our sun is basically a G2 type star. And as you can see, these are all by scale. So if sun is that size, this is how big an O type star is. Okay, and what's interesting to see is that as you increase the mass, so M is the smallest, and obviously there are more brown dwarfs, et cetera. We're not gonna talk about them today. Um, but as you have more massive stars, the temperature, the surface temperature increases. But interestingly, the more massive you are, the less time you spend on a particular phase. So the more faster you die. And that's just, you know, thinking about it this way you have a whole set of fuel that you're trying to, you know, burn. Basically, a star is, you know, burning, uh, uh, you know, fusing material, and it's basically giving out energy. And you have all this material. Um, it's in a massive star, and it's, it's burning. It burns really, really fast. And so the life, life cycle of a bigger star or a more massive star is shorter compared to an M or a K-type star. Okay, so that is very interesting to see because we will see in a couple of slides how massive stars make completely different set of, I wouldn't say completely different set of elements, but a different set of elements uh, compared to low mass stars. And so that kind of, you know, draws you in in terms of, okay, so the massive stars actually spend less amount of time living their life compared to a more younger or more low mass star. And, and so that gives us an idea of why we could have very many of these heavier elements um, compared to what a low mass star would be producing. Anyways, uh, I kind of mentioned, you know, um, these stars actually have uh, varied surface temperature. They can range anywhere from 0.1 to 60 times the mass of our sun. And their surface temperature can range anywhere from 3,000 to onwards of 30, 40, 50,000 degrees on the surface. And they're, they're pretty, pretty hot. So let's look at now on the life cycle of these stars. So just like humans, they all have a life cycle and it all depends on their mass. So let's look at an average star. And by average, we mean, let's say sun-like star. When it forms from the stellar nebula, like an example that we looked at before, as it goes through its life, it's burning up, you know, you know it's basically fusing hydrogen into helium. Uh, once it's done that, it kind of becomes a red giant. So it basically swells up, it goes bigger. And then over time, what happens is it starts to lose its outer layers. And so that's where we call it a planetary nebula. It's not really a planetary, it has nothing to do with planets. It's very confusing for people uh, when you say planetary nebula. Um, 
this is basically all its original uh, um, outside shell basically shedding. And you have this really tiny star that's left in the middle um, that's a white dwarf. So let's look at what a red giant would look like, because, you know, we're trying to figure out what kind of elements form in these dying low mass stars. So in this particular star, before we go to planetary nebula, let's look at what a red giant uh, low mass star looks like from the inside, if we were able to go and slice it out. So here I have what we like to call an HR diagram. And the easiest way to think about this is you have the most coolest stars here on this side at the bottom right and the hottest stars on the bottom left. OK, so you can see it goes from 3000 to 30,000 degrees. And on the y axis, we actually have luminosity, which means how bright they are. So you can think about, you know, the top one right here being the brightest, the bottom right here not being as bright. So for a sunlight star, you know, right now it's in its main sequence phase, which is what this line is, which means it's, you know, fusing hydrogen into helium. Um, what you're going to what you're going to now see is going to happen that over time, once it's going through that red giant phase, it does this, you know, basically almost like a pulsation. It goes bigger and smaller. And based on that, you are changing its temperature and you're changing its size. And then obviously, luminosity or how bright you're able to see it based based on the size because the bigger the star the more brighter it looks the smaller the star um, the less bright it looks and that's just relative to uh, to the size so if I were to look at the inside what am I going to see well I'm going to see a hydrogen you know burning shell right here on the inside I'm seeing all this helium that is being fused and dumped into the center okay and once it reaches the temperature so over here, I can see once it reaches the temperature, then when it's going to start burning the helium in the center, that's going to, the helium is going to fuse and try to create carbon. And that carbon is then going to form inside in this lovely black dot that you right see right here, which it's not burning. It's just being the buildup is happening for carbon. And the way to think about this one is almost like a small onion. So we cut out an onion, you see inside, you have these lovely layers that you are seeing. The innermost layer is inactive. It's not burning. It's just an inert thing that is being created and be, being dumped into the center. But everything outside is, is burning. Okay, And so as you can see, depending on all of these phases, it goes through the phase where you know it, it heats up and you have the helium that starts burning and it, uh, and it starts to produce carbon. Carbon is in there. And then it reaches to a temperature when carbon can ignite you can get a phase where, okay, now carbon is, uh, you know, basically fusing into uh, nitrogen. So you keep going and going. But for low mass stars, what ends up happening is that by the time you reach carbon, um, it gets to a phase where it sheds out all of its uh, outer layers. And so you get through this phase where you see the brightness is almost steady, but the temperature is getting hotter and hotter, okay? It gets really hot, and then once all the layers are shedded, you just become a white dwarf and you just live your life kind of, you know, just getting rid of the radiation that you have. However, during that time, you can imagine all of these layers are being blown up into uh, the surrounding areas. And that can contain carbon and all these other elements that are created in the planetary nebula and in the star itself. So now let's look at the massive one, because as I mentioned before, based on you know, whether you're a low mass star or a high mass star, your life looks different. And so for a massive star, you know, it forms from a nebula, it basically fuses hydrogen into helium. That's when we call it on the main sequence. And then it goes into the super red giant phase or red super giant phase. Um, and obviously it's way more bigger now. And then it ends up that you're gonna have a supernova and you're going to either form a neutron star or a black hole. Let's look at what the onion phase or what, what the inside of the supergiant would look like if I were to be able to slice it. OK, so let's look at that particular phase. This is actually what it's going to look like. A supergiant is going to be you know, billions of kilometers in size, almost Jupiter's orbit, as you see right here. But the inside, the very center of it, is actually going to look like that. So remember, for the low mass star, we looked at hydrogen, helium, carbon, and carbon being inert, and it's, it's not burning. You go a lot deeper 
for a high mass star. You are now, we're able to produce carbon, neon, oxygen, silicon, all the way up to iron, okay? So it really looks like a real big onion where you have all of these different shells that are basically burning everything up until iron, okay? Once you get to iron, you get to a phase where, you know, it just cannot fuse. You cannot reach that very, very high temperature it needs to fuse iron into the next element, okay? So at that point, what ends up happening is you're going to go supernova because at this point, you cannot do anything other than this heat building up in the inside, okay? And when heat builds up, one really interesting thing about stars is that Star's life is all about fighting between the pressure from the inside that is, you know, being generated from all of these chemical reactions that are going on with the basic outside pulling into the gravity. So it's a fight between gravity and pressure, okay? The moment it loses one of them, you have, you know, either a planetary nebula or you get a supernova. And so that what, that's what happens when you, have, when you reach iron in the core of, of a massive red supergiant. And one of the interesting things that happens is that you get this amazing supernova. And, and, you know, we haven't really seen any supernova, but we have these amazing pictures from, you know, places like Hubble, where we can get these pictures of remnants. And I have two pictures here, and I'll, I'll talk about two different kinds of supernovas. So on the left, I have type 2 supernova, which is what you would get if you had, you know, a massive star that actually blows out and you have all this material that's basically shedding. And in this, when it does go supernova, the temperature is so high, it's in billions of degrees. During those you know, few seconds where this is happening is all those other heavy elements past iron that you see in the periodic table that are naturally occurring actually form. And so that's very interesting to see that it's able to create that environment where it's so, so, so hot. They're able to fuse you know, and, and create these amazing metals that otherwise don't actually form, aren't able to form in, in the mass of stars. Now on the right hand side, I have what I would call a type 1a supernova. It's, it's, it's categorized as type 1a supernova. But this supernova is actually not from a massive star. And so what the supernova is, uh, remember we talked about these white dwarf stars um, that are basically I guess in some ways, dead bodies of young stars, or sorry, low mass stars. And when they're in a binary situation, so you have a small um, you know, white dwarf and you have another star that is in a binary system with it, you can have material from this massive star actually you know, seep into and onto the white dwarf. And so when that happens, um, when that actually ends up happening, what happens is there's only so much the white dwarf can take. There is a limit to how much, uh, how massive the white dwarf can get before it explodes. And it's called the Chandrasekhar limit. It's actually 1.4 times the mass of our sun. And when it does do that, you get this giant explosion um, that what we see as, as a supernova, but it's actually a particular type of supernova. And they're so neat that they, because they always have a supernova that is such a particular mass that we can actually use them as standard candles because they will basically explode at uh, you know a certain mass and uh, with certain brightness and so you can use them as candles to figure out distances in the universe um, but both of them obviously produce uh, certain elements that you otherwise are not able to produce in inside the star so these are you know um, a lot of the times, I, I don't know if people have heard, but you know, in 2009, the year of astronomy, I had heard this code and I always remember it's, it's thank those dead stars <laughs> for why you're here today. And you can see why, because you know, a lot of the metals uh, that you're seeing here on Earth and, and in our solar system actually formed in these dead stars. So it's pretty neat. And then recently I mentioned that the new periodic astronomers periodic table had this really neat, uh, neat research uh, that is being done right now, is that we have figured out that all of these shiny metals like gold and silver were actually formed in neutron star mergers. So neutron stars, obviously, so when you have massive stars, they die, they go supernova, you can have one of the two leftovers. You can have a neutron star. If the original star was anywhere between eight and 25 times of the mass of our sun, if you're any bigger than 25 times the mass of our sun, 
you would have a black hole as a leftover. So what happened during this research was they were actually looking at uh, the light that was coming from, from these two neutron stars that actually merged. And what they figured out was that it turns out that the neutron stars, when they did merge, the, the amount of energy that's shedding um, and the material that's mixing, all of that actually produced these amazing um, shiny elements that we, we all love here on Earth. And so this is a very, very neat, very, very recent research that has been happening. And, you know, we'll definitely learn more. Um, obviously, we don't know about exactly um, everything about all the elements, um, because obviously we astronomers, you know, like to use very many different ways of trying to understand how they form. So I'm going to quickly go over how do we actually study a lot of these? And these are just some of the many, many ways of studying the cosmos to understand where these elements are actually coming from. So the first one is, is a telescope, obviously. We use, astronomers love to use telescopes. A lot of you, um, you know, also do it in, you know, use it in your backyard. And one of the ways we like to do is we like to use what we call a spectroscope. So all of you may have seen a rainbow where, you know, a droplet of water actually acts as a prism where it splits the light, the white light into many colors. Just like that, we obviously have to put in, there is no droplet of water, so we put in a glass prism to split the light that's coming from the stars. And what we get is something that's amazing. We, we want to, we all know that elements have their own fingerprints and these are unique to each of the elements it's just like our own fingerprints so when we have a fingerprint you know it goes to you know one person it's basically their own fingerprint it's different from ev everyone else here on earth and that's the same with the stars when we look at their light the elements have these unique fingerprints so let's look at this particular picture so in this, on the top, I have an O-type star. Remember, these are the biggest kinds of stars. And as you go down, you have, you know, smaller and smaller stars all the way to the M-type. At the bottom, you have, you know, the wavelength. This is basically when you are looking at all of these colors that I have right here, and you spread them up, and you are putting them onto, onto a plate. What you do see here are a lot of these dark patches, okay? And these are these unique fingerprints of different elements. On the top, I'm not sure if you're able to read, but I'll read it out loud. Over here, you have this very dark patch that is for hydrogen, okay? All of this here, right here is helium. This line is also helium. But then you also have iron, you have manganese, you have all of these different kinds of, kinds of elements that you find. And over here at the bottom, there are tons more. You have everything from calcium, iron, uh, you know, uh, sodium, things like that. All of the things that you can think of are, you know, are found in these, not only in these stars, but around these stars as well. So you have, you know, the, the materials where, where the planets are forming you can also find uh, a lot of different kinds of elements in those as well. And we use, all we get is light because we cannot travel there. We use what we get and we get light and we use that to figure out what's around in and around these stars. What else we use? So as a computational astrophysicist, I use something like a computer to generate the star and what the material is around it and the amount of material that's around it. So a lot of people, obviously, in terms of there are tons of, you know, theoretical models, computational models on, on where these elements are, when they form, at what temperature, in what areas, uh, things like that. Um, so computational models obviously help us to understand a lot of the back end um, of how these things are forming. With the light, you can see them. You can say, all right, they exist there, but how do they come up? You know, we use computer models to, to kind of connect the dots. And then, you know, one of the other things, uh, this is actually a meteorite. Uh, one of the cool things is that sometimes here on Earth, we're lucky enough, we get, you know, bombarded with these giant rocks, not very giant, because then we're not very lucky, but the small ones enough that actually have a leftover that we can then investigate. So this particular meteorite uh, is, you know, it's very recent study where they have done that this one has what we call pre-solar grains. So this is material that's from before the uh, even our sun formed. Okay, so this particular meteorite is said to have, uh, you know, inclusions or material from around 7 billion years ago. And that's like, we you know, our sun is around 4.5 billion years old. So that's from before our own solar system was formed. And so it's very interesting and neat that we have in our hands this material that we cannot go to a star and get. 
but are given to us just you know handed off being like hey here you can study these amazing you know uh, elements that were that were available or material that was formed before our sun was formed these kinds of amazing um you know inclusions allow us to kind of figure out what kind of you know uh temperature or what kind of um uh, situations these things were formed in. You could have, you know, different kinds of pressure, different kind of material that it's formed from. So, you know, there are different ways of trying to study where these elements were formed, when they were formed, how they were formed. And and so I would, you know, like to say that we we wouldn't be really here if it wasn't really for those stars basically shedding all this material into the space where we then ended up forming from uh, that same material, our sun formed, our planets formed, uh, and all the material around it basically seeded life here on Earth, or at least that's what we think. Um, and, and so, you know, recycling of a lot of these stellar material is kind of why we are here, or, or the reason why life is here on Earth. And so, you know, if we want to kind of wrap up, I mentioned that that bad astronomers periodic table but if we look at each of the element um, and kind of figure out where each of these elements come from we know hydrogen and helium came from the, the very 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 start of the universe but what about the rest you can actually go back to the chemist periodic table and put in all we have learned into this amazing color-coded I guess, a graph in many ways because you can see from the Big Bang we have the lovely hydrogen and helium and then you know a little bit of a little bit of lithium in there and then we have what we call cosmic ray fusion so they're cosmic rays these are high energetic rays that actually uh you know are bombarded to us on an almost daily basis our universe in many ways uh all the time and they form these unstable elements which only you know are there for a very very short amount of times and that this this includes beryllium and boron but past that you can see that the green basically denotes all the material, all the elements that are formed in an exploding mass of star. You have all the yellow that is formed in exploding, you know, low mass stars. And then we have some of those exploding white dwarfs. Remember, this is the type 1a supernova, the white dwarf are the type 1a supernovas. Uh, while the normal supernova, which people would like to call it, would be the exploding mass of stars. And then this one, the orange one, is pretty new. Uh, the neutron star merger creating all of these elements. You can see it's a mixture of yellow and orange in many of the elements that you are seeing, uh, especially in this, you know, the last in the bottom half of the table. So, you know, we can summarize that all of these elements that, that are known to us, other than the man-made ones, are made in these format. And, and you know, kind of, I don't want to leave you with this particular, because it's uh, it's... It's mind blowing in many ways, but I want you to think one thing every time you go outside and look at the night sky. So next time you see the galaxy or you see the stars in your night sky, I would say, go ahead, have a look and think about, you know, how those stars are in us, but also we are in those stars in many ways. So if you think about in 10 billion years from now, you know, uh, our sun would have gone planetary into a planetary nebula phase and into a white dwarf. All that material would then be part of the cosmos. But right now, we are here because of all the material that you have that has been around in the universe for the billions of years. So I just want to leave you guys with that thought. And with that, I will take any questions that you guys might have. Thank you so much, Dr. Patel. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yeah, we have a question. Um, it's how rare are heavy elements in the sun's core distinguished from the outer layer? Yeah, so um, because the sun is formed, you know, what's happening in the core is all this hydrogen is basically fusing into helium. OK, so they are very, very, very trace elements, just like how you would have, you know, the trace elements in terms of numbers for uh, for the universe. It's very, very, very minute. And you can imagine that all the core, especially the core is basically um, all that being is being produced from hydrogen in and in, in, into helium. So, you know, that shell that is still not burning, it's inert, is basically all the uh, the helium that is in there. So it's a very, 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 very minute.
Um, can I ask a question? I had another question, actually. Uh, thank you so much for that overview of the life cycle of stars. I was wondering what the latest research is suggesting about what happened with Betelgeuse this winter. We observed some substantial dimming, um, yeah. and I'm just curious if you have any information about that. Yeah, so I think uh, a lot of the people were wondering if it was going to explode, if it was at that phase where it was going to go, you know, uh, kaboom. But uh, it has been noticed recently that dimming is, you know, the dimming is happening. Um, so it probably just went through that phase of, you know, the 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 place where it was just, you know, becoming bigger and it was becoming brighter. And then over time, and, you know, Betelgeuse is kind of known for that uh, variable, um, you know, just dimming and brightening up. Um, but this one obviously was substantial. Uh, so people kind of got worried for, from what I know um, is that, uh, that you know, it's, it's, it was just a normal thing, just a little bit more brighter than normal. Um, I know that if people are looking for more information, I haven't really looked into much into it. Uh, Serafina Nance on Twitter, she posts a lot about that. Um, and from what I gathered from her tweets was that, you know, it was it was back to normal in ma many ways and uh, it, it's not going to explode anytime soon, at least. That's great. I think we have a few more questions. Um, someone's asking, what excites you about studying star formation? Yeah, so I've, it was interesting that I was, uh, I, for some reason, I was always gravitated towards how stars and planets form. I think, I think it would have been from the fact that when I first when I had my own telescope, I think the, the only thing I was kind of looking at were planets. And, and, and I always wondered, you know, how they formed. I re read about the books. And, and, and also, you know, when you're studying pl uh, planet formation, you always also trying to understand what the star is doing at the same time. And so I think there was a connection. When I started my undergrad, I specifically was looking for someone, uh, you know, studying how planets form. And, and I realized that, you know, there's so much disk physics that goes into and it's so interesting to study these disks that are around these stars. And it doesn't really matter around what kind of stars they are because they're, they're disk, like the physics stays the same. And so when I moved into my master's, I, um, I kind of got intrigued about studying uh, these this disk material that's actually shedded off from the star. Um, these are called uh, BE stars, and, and you know their material kind of sheds off from the equator and forms a disk around them. And so, so I was still intending to wanting to study planets, but then I got, you know, kind of sidetracked in many ways trying to study these disks. And so when I was doing my PhD, I kind of wanted to bring back in some ways to kind of studying young stars where eventually these planets form. And so um, I got really excited when I was able to find a topic of study around her big stars. So these are very, very young, but very massive. So the, you know, the flavor of the stars we looked at, these are the O and B type stars, especially the B type stars. They're called Harbig BE stars. Um, and so I've kind of used my knowledge from my undergrad to, to understand planet formation and then understand disc, disc physics from a master's uh, to then trying to study these Harbig stars. And, and, you know, throughout the way, I've always loved planet formation and, and star formation and they go hand in hand so much that, um, you know, I feel like I started off with my love of planets, but ended up onto the stars in many ways. So, yeah. Awesome. Um, we have another question. Are there websites where one could track black hole mergers as they happen? I think uh, they obviously take time to kind of put out information. A lot of that information comes out in forms of research, uh, but I'm pretty sure that as soon as the research is published, the LIGO on their website always has these news updates with all of these new mergers and what they have found, what kind of research. So, you know, just checking out the LIGO feed, even, they're also on Twitter and, you know, if you look on Facebook, so just follow them. Um, and, and they generally post these in-depth, uh, you know, articles about, about the new research with these mergers. We also know that um, new elements have been created in laboratories every year, um, but they have a very short life. Um, for example, element 119 this year. So uh, would such elements also be created in star cores? Could we find them there? So a lot of that's a really good question. A lot of the elements. Um, so you know when I when I showed you the the onion structure, you saw some of them. You saw you know things like neon. But if you look at the periodic table and you go to iron, there are a lot more elements in the middle. 
But the thing is that they're not very stable. Um, even things like beryllium and boron, like they're not very stable elements. So what happens is they're formed, but very quickly, uh, their shelf life is very, very short. Their half life is very short. So, you know, they, they, they exist and then they go away. So uh, we do know that they form in the, those times. Uh, there are a lot. So a lot of the elements that you see on the, the periodic table, I'm going to go back and kind of go back to the periodic table. So you see a lot of these elements here that you do see that they form in either the exploding stars or low mass stars dying or, or exploding white dwarf, but not all of them are stable that you're able to find in the environment. So there are definitely tons that have a very short half-life. Um, another question is, which of the two have stronger gravitational force, neutron stars or black holes? Black holes, definitely black holes. They are basically the ones that that lead in terms of, you know, the enormous gravity that they have um, and and you know something that i mentioned in passing but i should probably emphasize is that even though um you know they both come up from the, the exploding stars what ends up happening is that uh any any stars that are between eight times and 25 times the mass of our sun they end up as neutron stars. Anything that's more massive than 25 times the mass of the sun, they end up as black holes. And definitely black holes are, are one of the most, um, you know, uh, intriguing objects in the night sky, but also hold the most gravity. Amazing, thank you. Um, Eric asks, the first generation of stars had very few metals in them, but what are future generations of stars going to be like, and will they behave differently since the proportion of metals will have increased? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so first generation of stars definitely did not have any metals in them. They were pure hydrogen and helium. Obviously, over time, they you know, populated the universe with, with the heavy metals. And you know that is happening on an everyday basis. You see a star dying. It's basically shedding all those metals. Um, we don't really see a very much difference right now because you know it, it while the stars are dying we have a lot more stars forming um you know we have a lot more material being consumed at the same time it's being produced so um i don't know like 10 billion years from now what it's going to look like but you know in, in the near future it doesn't really seem to be very many different other than the fact that you know you have all of these planetary systems that have all these heavier metals or metals as an astronomer's metals present uh, in its surrounding so, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, Barbie asks, are you excited about the James Webb Telescope? And what do you think is most exciting about this? Yeah, I'm really excited about James Webb Telescope. So you, you saw amazing, thanks Barry for this question. <laughs> you saw amazing pictures. You know, I love looking at the pictures of star forming regions because again, it's kind of my first love in many ways when it comes to astronomy. Um, and a lot of those pictures are from Hubble. And, you know, J JWST is the successor for Hubble, bigger, better, more technology. And we Canadians have, you know, um, have a part in JWST. So I'm really looking forward to actually more uh, star formation research as well as more exoplanet research um, using JWST and Canadian contribution to that. Amazing. I'm really excited for these pictures then. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, Riza, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, also asks, um, what are the forces involved in star formation? And she also says, fantastic overview, by the way. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, so in, in terms of star formation, it's a lot to do with gravity. Um, and, and, you know, uh, once the star is formed, obviously I mentioned, you know, how it's more competing between pressure and gravity. But when it forms, it's mostly, um, you know, gravity forming those clumps. Uh, one of the other neat thing uh, in terms of star formation is that uh, a lot of the star formation gets triggered when these supernovas go off. So these supernovas actually, you know, basically have either you have the wind or you have the material that's propagating through these star forming regions that ignite the star formation. So, you know, you have gravity, but you also have a hand from an external, um, you know, event that happens, um, whether it's supernova or, you know, other kinds of mergers, um, things like that. So those are kind of the key things for, for stars to form. Great. Um, we also have another question asking if we're able to still observe any first generation star regions um, or have they all now sort of gone through that phase of metal forming? 
Yeah, so we are able to observe kind of the remnants of, of these stars. Um, and, you know, we, we actually have the technology to be able to kind of go back and look at this observable universe, at least at the tail end of the observable universe. So, you know, we, we study with a combination of the, the data from that kind of air, area plus the computational models that we already have um, to be able to understand, you know, what happened to those stars. Um, you can almost say, like in many ways, I like to, you know, call these astronomers or, or astronomers in many ways like detectives because they are, they are kind of, you know, you're on a crime scene, you're now trying to figure out things using these puzzles that you see everywhere um, in the sky. So yeah, we're, we're basically looking back in time and using those in addition to our computer models to try to understand what happened. That's a really cool analogy. I like that. <laughs> yeah. I like to call uh, myself a stellar detective. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> that should be a Twitter username if it's not already taken. <laughs> um, we have another question of where in the galaxy are most stars born? Um, and does nuclear fission also play a part in its birth? Yeah, so the most stars actually in our Milky Way galaxy um, happens, it's almost everywhere because our our Milky Way galaxy is youngish, so you can have different kinds of galaxy where you have some where they're older and you have less star formation or almost no star formation happening. In our uh, Milky Way galaxy, we have the arms that has, you know, a lot of material where a lot of uh, star formation happens. Um, and, you know, for stars to form, um, basically you need these few things. You need a soup of, you know, gas and dust. Um, and you need, uh, you know, these external elements or external events to kind of trigger um, these clumps to come together and stars to start to happen. So as long as you have things like that, so things like, you know, places like our spiral arms, um, you can definitely trigger star formation. Um, and I think the second part of the question was, do nuclear uh, fusion help in any way in forming stars? The original question was nuclear fission, but... Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So nuclear fusion... Fission happens, so nuclear fusion happens inside the star. It, there's, it, it doesn't really have anything to do in terms of triggering a star formation. Uh, it's mostly uh, the mergers of, you know, black holes or, or neutron stars or any kind of supernovas that goes off, which basically sends ripples into these regions that actually ignite the star formation. Great. Um, I actually have a question about, um, you were saying that the shedding of the nebula, it sort of releases like, um, or during that formation, um, that's when a lot of the elements are formed past iron. So does that mean that a lot of these elements are formed just like within a few seconds? Yeah, so they're actually forming a very, very short amount of time. And I actually, I think I have a, I have a slide here in terms of the amount of time it takes. So let me actually bring that up. Um, so I, I, I knew this is a question going to come. They always, people always <laughs> ask about this. So if you take a 25 solar mass star, which is right at the edge of whether it's going to be a neutron star or a black hole, um, and, and you can see that once the core collapses, you basically have like seconds for these things to form. However, the temperature that is going on is way, way high. It's billions and billions of degrees. And so it's it's the, the, the fraction of seconds in, in, I guess, human, I wouldn't say human time scale, in, 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 the, in the astronomical time scale is when you would have these elements, elements actually form. It's crazy how fast that happens. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're, like, we've taken years to sort of study them, so that's yeah. really cool. <laughs> um, so far, we have one more question, and it's, what is the upper limit to star size? And were first-generation stars huge? Mm -hmm. Really good question. Um, so for as far as we know in terms of kind of how, so star sizes obviously can where you can have very, very massive stars if you're looking at red, red supergiants. But if you talk about the stars that kind of, you know, start off from that forming, which is where like our sun, where it is at, you can have like up to 50, 60 times solar mass. Um, and, you know, you can find other more massive stars, but that would be at a different stage in their life, not really when they form. Um, and I think the second question was, uh, if you could repeat. Yeah, they were if first generation stars were huge. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't actually know if, if they were huge. That's a really good question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know if, if they were huge, small, what sizes they were. They were completely made of hydrogen and helium. So I would think that they would be something along the lines of, of our sun. 
kind of tracing from where hydrogen to helium forms, but I'm not entirely sure. Sorry about that. Well, thank you so much. Um, on behalf of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada Toronto Centre and the RASC DDO Committee, um, Dr. Patel, thank you so much for sharing this fantastic presentation with us. It's really nice to know where we come from. Uh, if you would like to learn more about Dr. Patel, please visit her website. Uh, that's parshetipatel.com. I think we're going to add a, a link to that in our description a bit later. Uh, many thanks also to our technical support team, Andrew Reed, Blake Nancaro, Ward Legro, and Ennio Cellucci, uh, and to our coordinator, Celia Du, for organizing this event and fielding questions from the YouTube chat. A special thank you to all our viewers for joining us this evening and for your questions. This talk has been the first in a series of lecture nights at the David Dunlap Observatory, offered through the partnership of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, Toronto Centre, and the City of Richmond Hill. For a complete schedule of RASC events, please visit us online at rasco.ca. Uh, our next lecture night at the DDO will feature an astrophysicist, Mohammed Shaban, on May 23rd at 7.30 p.m. We'll see you back here for the live stream of that event.